Coming up on Chasing the Natty, the first wave of spring games in 2024 have been played, giving us our first look at some actual college football around the country. We'll be touching on everything from the state of a couple of ACC offenses to a plethora of G5 QB competitions, as well as some notes from some scrimmages this past week. We've got all of that and more coming right after this. This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everyone. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chasing the Natty podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful ride to your work on this Monday morning. We are the College Fantasy Football Podcast on the Campus of Canton Podcast Network. You can find us on all of your podcast feeds and on YouTube every Monday morning during the offseason at 6 a.m. sharp. If you want to support the great work we're doing here, head on over to campusofcanton.com and subscribe there with one of our expeditious tiers. You'll find everything you need for your CFF, Devi, C2C, IDP, betting needs. Again, pretty much anything you want to do when it comes to the game of college football. We got rankings, articles, tools, anything that'll help you with all of those different leagues. You can find me and the show on Twitter. I am at CFF underscore Jared. And the show is at Chasing the Natty. Definitely want to be following that show account recently. We've been putting up some pretty awesome graphics about some of the ADP trends that have been going on in drafts lately some guys that are coming at a bigger discount than they did just a month ago and some guys that are pretty much on the rise so you need to be aware of that so you don't wait too long to grab them in drafts that being said welcome in everybody we're riding solo again this week at least on my end again just because i don't have a guest here doesn't mean that you all listening are not my guests i'm inviting you in here into my own little world some great Great research we're able to do this past week in terms of a lot of these spring games, a lot of these scrimmages that have been coming out. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. We got nine different, um, actually, no, we got 12 different teams we'll talk about, but kind of nine different segments because I kind of saved all the scrimmage information at the end. I thought this is going to be a pretty slow week when it came to these spring games because really it's like next week when really things start to kick off in a big way. And this week was kind of the appetizer to that. But between Clemson, NC State, Auburn, uh, three good power, f- power five schools that we got some great information from. We got some good stuff from Toledo, UAB, Southern Miss, UNLV. Uh, SMU had theirs as well, which was great to hear because it sounds like Preston Stone is healthy and ready to go. I actually didn't make a slide for them or a segment for them, but that is pretty important information there that Preston Stone looks like he's practicing ready to go he'll be good to go by the fall which is excellent excellent news for people who've been drafting him and i believe the top 25 qbs lately and yeah or excuse me i almost had that right he's going as qb 26 in draft so you're pretty much looking at him right there at the end of the 10th round i could see him moving up now that we're getting information stating that he is going to be good to go by the fall so look at me i'm already jumping right into news and notes and everything I haven't really let you guys settle down get comfortable and everything like that. But that's just how it be when, you know, not, I can't have anybody respond to me in terms of small chit chat. So I don't know about you guys. I think we should go ahead and start hopping right into these spring games with a couple of quick announcements. First, again, if you guys haven't already one, join a CFF Dynasty League if you have not already. But two, if you do play in a CFF Dynasty League, make sure you go check out Defending the Natty. It is on the camp, or excuse me, on the uh, Chasing the Natty podcast feed exclusive. It's there once a month on the 15th of every month. Last month, Nate and I discussed our initial CFF Dynasty rankings. This next month, we're going to talk about some freshmen. Be on the lookout for that over the next week here. And then speaking of freshmen and just Dynasty slash C2C in general, make sure you check out the Freshman Supplemental Guide to Campus of Canton. Dot com and we also got another guide coming out at campus for those of you who play nfl dynasty we got a rookie guide coming out it's only five dollars and it pretty much like 
gathers all the information that we've been providing for these guys over the last couple of years since they come out of high school gives you a complete window into how they started how they've developed over time excellent excellent value you're getting only five bucks and you're pretty much getting three years worth of content out of it it's going to be absolutely insane next year or it should be out within the next week or so uh, i need to get an actual date on that shame on me for not reaching out to the guys on that but regardless be on the lookout at campuskent.com now we're done with announcements i think we can get right into some of these spring games so we'll start off with Clemson. Again, we'll start off with probably the three power five schools, and then we'll kind of get down into the mix when it comes to a lot of these G5 schools. Again, a lot of great information out this past weekend. Shout out to a lot of these beat reporters for providing really, really detailed looks into these spring games. Again, shout out to, of course, Matthew Loves Ball on YouTube for especially the power five or really any team that gets their spring game on television. He records it, cuts it down for you, made it really easy to actually get some eyeballs on what happened here in some of these games. So shout out to everybody who has been covering these and providing great information. And now I'm here to kind of bring it all together for you guys who are listening. So like I said, we'll start with Clemson here. The main takeaway I had with Clemson in this spring game is that for those that were hoping that Clemson's offense in year two of Garrett Riley was going to take a step forward, at least as of now, I think you're going to be somewhat disappointed. Cade Klubnik really does look pretty rough for a guy that is now going into his second year as the full-time starter for Clemson. He started off very, very rough on this game. The first drive he had went for negative three yards, during which Klubnik almost threw a interception. Uh, it was it was a ball that was batted in the air, but regardless, like the fact they got batted in the air was something there. And then on the second drive, uh, it seemed to be going pretty decently. Uh, Klubnik immediately or then uh, killed the drive by heavily underthrowing Adam Randall. Again, the announcers tried to kind of blame it on Randall run, running the wrong route, but it just looked like a straight underthrow from Klubnik's perspective. So he had a very very rough start. Kind of put things a little bit together by the end. Uh, ended the day with a touchdown and, and again that interception that I was talking about but for those that were kind of hoping that are drafting club Nick where where is he going right now QB 48 in drafts like in the end of the 19th round or end of the 20th round excuse me uh, I mean again I don't I don't think that's the worst value in the world there but it's I don't know if this is really going to be that year where he takes that next major jump there I believe he finished in the top 50 QBs last year, but I, I just don't see him making a big jump outside of that. Um, there was another quarterback who was kind of interesting on the day. Again, Trent Pierman. Never really heard of this guy before, but he looked like, the, honestly, the most impressive quarterback on the day, both on the ground and through the air. Uh, had a beautiful pass to Bryant Wesco, the true freshman there, for nine yards. He also took a 49-yard run to the house. I believe he had easily the best completion percentage on the day for a guy that was running with both the orange and the white teams. He was the backup quarterback for both of the teams behind uh, Klubnik and Vizina. So, again, he was getting a mix of both second-team and first-team defenses, and, he, again, he looked really, really solid. So... I don't know if you're in a really deep dynasty league and you just want to throw him on your roster just in case maybe he transfers somewhere. He looks pretty solid elsewhere. Who knows? Uh, but again, speaking of other dynasty values, it, we got a really, really good look at Brian Wesco, who did score a touchdown this game. Absolutely looks like the real deal in terms of the talent there. I don't know if he's going to really break into that starting lineup. Obviously, he's got Tyler Brown there. Antonio Williams, who I'll talk about in a second. He's back. He's healthy and quite frankly, looks like the best player on the field, right? That's all I had to say is that he, he, he caught a, he caught about a half dozen balls and in my opinion, looked like the best player on the field. So for those of you who are drafting Antonio Williams late in your drafts, let's see, where is he going? Let me look at the ADP real quick. Um, He is going wide receiver 116 <laughs> and like well past the 20th round. You're looking at, uh, good Lord, I can't do this again. Average of 318.3 in ADP. So you're looking at a guy who's going past the 25th round. I honestly don't think at that value, it's a crazy idea. I mean, if Williams is if Williams is back to being healthy, now, do I think he has a ceiling to end up being a top 20 wide receiver? No, but he'll out 
he'll outperform wide receiver 116 pretty easily in my opinion so i don't know that's just kind of my thought on that um that's pretty much all i had really on on clemson again nothing really assuaged my fears in terms of looking at this offense and saying that oh they're gonna be so much better this year they're going to be a they're gonna be back to those clemson offenses of old when you had travis Etienne and you had trevor lawrence back there throwing to um oh my goodness like back when justin ross was healthy and it was just absolute madness what they were able to do i just don't think clemson's gonna be able to do it this year and i think part of it is that club nick as long as he's quarterback kind of limits that offense in a pretty decent way it also doesn't help that of course again Dabo refusing to bring in help from the transfer portal really does put them in a rut when they are sitting there knowing that they have deficiencies at certain positions, but they're not willing to go out and get guys that are just sitting right there. It's interesting, weird. We'll see. But for right now, the Clemson, uh, the Clemson spring game was pretty much a, not a confirmation, but it, like I said, it didn't assuage my fears of Clemson not really still not returning to form this year now on the other side of the coin an offense that I knew had potential but this spring game again it looked really really good we got to talk about the NC State Wolfpack here man this is like the opposite of Clemson again Clemson refusing to bring in guys NC State said we know we got problems we know we got issues all over the field here we know for a fact our running backs aren't up to par. We know for a fact our quarterback play was not up to par. We know for a fact that outside of Kevin Concepcion, our wide receivers are leaving something to be desired. So what did they do? They went and grabbed a crap ton of guys out of the portal. And really the three biggest names, how, shoot, I would say uh, five biggest names when you include two other receivers are the story of this game. And as well as a freshman quarterback who we'll get to here in a second, but I guess we'll start with the quarterbacks here. Grayson McCall, slightly worried. Again, he's coming off injury. His passing ability has been here and there. A lot of people believe that his abilities at Coastal Carolina were them, you know, playing strong to his strengths, which is what you do as an offensive coordinator, but at the same time, like giving him really easy throws, not really asking him to push the ball down the field too much. That's not what I saw here. I saw a Grayson McCall that looked way more comfortable than he has in years. He was putting some balls in some really tight places in this game. And I I think I might have been might have been us underestimating Grayson McCall it fitting into this system. Robert Rene, I continue to believe is one of the best offensive coordinators in the game. I am just amazed every single time the kind of players that he works with, the People that would not work in any other system, he is able to change things and move things around in order to play to his player's strengths. And he looks like he's done so again here with Grace McCall. McCall went 16 of 20 on the day. It's a completion percentage of 80%, 205 yards. Like, again, with a couple of touchdowns to go along with it. McCall, like I said, looked really, really comfortable. And this is a guy that's going as QB 32 in drafts, like around the 15th round. I'm personally starting to get more okay with the idea of moving him up because I currently have him right there at QB 32, but like I'll take him now over TJ Finley. I'll take him over Cam Ward. I'll take him. Uh, this, one, this one gets a little bit harder because again, you got a lot of guys ahead of him now who fit into systems really well, like Kyron Drones, Chandler Morris at North Texas, but like that's the tier I think he belongs in, right? These are like, Guys that fit really, really well into those systems. I think Grace McCall is now showing that he can fit into this Robert Dene system pretty dang well. And I'm excited about that. Which really sucks because I re- really liked um, Cedric Bailey, who is the quarterback, true freshman quarterback coming in behind Grace McCall. Part of me was kind of hoping, again, uh, not hoping, but like, Wondering if Grayson McCall, if he faltered at any point this year, if we would see a true freshman quarterback in C.J. Bailey take over the reins. That looks a little bit harder nowadays, but Bailey's still going to put up a fight because he also looked really, really good in this game. I couldn't really find any of his passing numbers, but I do know for a fact that he had four rushes for 72 yards. Um, The staff talks about him clearly being the guy of the future for NC State, which is, again, 
great news to hear from a CFF Dynasty perspective and just knowing it, it for the future. Robert Ane brought him in in just three months of being on campus. He's already worked his way up to QB2. Now, granted, not the strongest competition in the world there at NC State, but, but still, the fact that he fits the system this well is super great to hear. The fact that he's a rusher is good to know for the future. It's going to be, I again, not that I'm rooting for it, but Grace would call obviously fits the system super well, but I don't know that Bailey's that far behind him when you watch them in the games. Now, Bailey has some fresh mistakes, don't get me wrong. That's probably why McCall will hold on to this job for as long as possible. But if McCall goes down and Bailey takes over for him afterwards, I really don't know if Bailey gives up that job. That's how good of a quarterback he is just as a true freshman, how well he fits into the system. So we'll see. Again, that's the quarterback situation. Clearly, it's going to be McCall. Again, don't hear what I'm not saying. McCall will be the quarterback. I just really like Bailey, and we're, we're going to talk about him more on the next DTN episode as well. Easily one of the best sashes this year. So outside of the quarterbacks, one thing I didn't really expect to talk about with NC State and like Robert and I's system is the running backs, but I think the running backs are worth discussing here. Jordan Waters seems to be... I don't want to say he's a bell cow. I think that's going too far with it, but it, he clearly seems like the 1A or excuse me, the one, and then you have guys like Hollywood Smothers, Raphael, and a couple others behind him who are like 2A, B, and C, and they're not as far behind him. So it's like they're kind of going committee, but just based on Waters' usage and the way he performed in this game, again, he ran for 69 yards and a touchdown, caught several balls, was targeted even more times. He seems like the guy that they're going to have out there, I would say, probably at least 40% of the time. Like, while the others kind of get their split of, like, 15% here and there, like, Waters will be out there a good chunk of the time. And currently, he's going as the RB65 at the end of the 16th round. That's how it currently seems to me. I could totally see Robert Renee get to a point where if Waters kind of continues to prove it more and more, he could have a greater and greater workload as the season goes along. And we've seen Robert Rene, again, we, we questioned it a little bit when he first got to Syracuse, like what it would mean for guys like LaQuint Allen and Sean Tucker. I mean, Rene, like I said, he, cha- he changes his offense to fit his personnel really well. And so it's not outside the realm of possibility that Waters gets more and more run if he is that main guy. So just... Waters is a guy that I've personally been underestimating. I watched him in the spring game. He looked really solid. I've got 71 running backs ranked right now. Waters is not one of them. I absolutely need to change that. I can absolutely see myself... Just kind of a quick glance. I can see myself moving him into... Maybe not quite... Top, not Maybe not quite. Excuse me. Maybe not quite my in my top 50 running backs. But most certainly top 60, if not top 55 here. And again, that, you're, you're listening to me right now, and you're like, oh, Jerry, that doesn't sound like a rigging endorsement. Again, this is a guy that I think is going to get maybe 40% of the rushing carries. That's not going to be a rigging endorsement of anybody, but for a guy that could potentially get a greater and greater workload, given the fact that he's done it before in the ACC and the coaching staff clearly likes him, something to keep in mind. I'll touch on the receivers last year after I take a sip of water. I lied. That was not a sip of water. That was a sip of sweet tea. But um, with the receivers, one thing that I kind of noticed was the the fact that Kevin Concepcion seemed pretty limited in this game. I don't think it had anything to do with injury, but I really I think that the staff was kind of holding him back. It's like, we know what you can do. We know you're going to be awesome. They gave him some manufactured touches here and there to once again show that that's how they're going to use him moving forward. But I really think the staff wanted to see what they had in some of these other guys and See what they had, they did. Noah Rogers, Justin Jolie, and Wesley Grimes had themselves some really, really good days. I guess we'll start with Noah Rogers, who led receivers on the day. He had seven catches, 133 yards. This is a dude that again, I'm not I'm not a Devi expert or anything like that, but Kevin Concepcion is an incredible football player. They manufacture touches. They get the ball to him in unique ways. I love to see it. But if you're talking about just a pure downfield receiver, I do think Rodgers might be better than KC. 
And I think he showed it a ton in this game. He looked smooth. He looked like a guy that was, again, on a different level compared to the defenders that were trying to stay on him. I really think he's going to be a problem for the ACC moving forward. And the good news with Robert Ane is that just because I'm hyping up Rob or Noah Rogers right now doesn't mean that I'm saying, like, oh, easy stock down on KC. Like, maybe it's a slight stock down. I'm already a little bit lower on KC than probably where people have been drafting him recently but i it's more about the fact that i think noah rogers he's currently going as wide receiver 128 in drafts 28th round i i think he's a pretty solid grab for best ball leagues again do i think he's going to be a guy that consistently every single week will be good for your cff teams probably not but again he's going to be a guy that's in an offense that passes a ton he's a downfield threat i like it and kind of the same thing with Justin Jolie and Wesley Grimes, right? Wesley Grimes, I'm a little bit more hesitant because he was kind of working with both the first team and the second team in this game. Regardless, he looked fantastic. He had two touchdowns on the day, one from 23 yards out uh, from Cedric Bailey. And then the third string quarterback, I forget his name off the top, of, top of my head, threw it to him on like the last drive of the game. And Wesley Grimes took it 90 yards, shaking a defender off of him. He's currently going undrafted in leagues. Like both Rodgers and Grimes. If you're looking for receivers at the end of your drafts and you're just kind of wanting to take shots on, looking for offenses that you just want to pieces of, those two guys seem perfect to me. And then the last one to talk about here is, again, it's a receiver, but again, he's tight end. But Justin Jolie, I was, I'm, I'm hesitant on going and getting transfer tight ends, right? Because they're never as good as they were. They're old school. It's like as much as I like Drake Dabney at TCU, the system and everything, the talent. It makes me a little hesitant there, but Justin Jolie, man, we've been hearing it all spring. We saw it in the spring game, three catches, 58 yards, and a touchdown. He's currently going as tight end 15 in drafts, 16th round. I would love to grab a guy like Aronde Gatson or a Harold Fannin, and then if I was able to get a guy like Justin Jolie as my second tight end with that high of upside in an offense that we've seen utilize the tight end well in the past... I mean, like, hard not to do, right? So, yeah, that's kind of the cover on NC State. Really, again, the overall theme here is that the offense looks great. The pieces are fitting in well. And as much as I might say to myself, like, oh, NC State, they've lost a lot on defense. That's a solid defensive staff they have going on over there. They're able to put together some defensive units every single year. So I choose to believe currently that means that this offense will be a problem for the ACC going into this fall. Let's move on to the next school here. Let's go to the Auburn Tigers, where we have ourselves a true freshman kind of stealing the story of the day, and that is Mr. Cam Coleman. If people have been kind of wondering which Auburn wide receiver, because they brought in quite a few true freshmen this year, that have been guys that you know people have been taking in supplemental drafts, people that people have been researching, looking at. It looks like Cam Coleman is that future uh, star wide receiver. He's had a consistent buzz throughout spring camp. Here he is coming into the spring game, reeling in four passes for 92 yards, scoring the lone touchdown on the day in this game. By the way, by the way, can we just talk about the fact that there were. This this game finished 28 to 27 and there was one touchdown scored in this game. <laughs> Just field goals galore. If you if you really like field goals, they kicked a lot of field goals in this game yesterday. Um but again, back to Cam Coleman again. Four catches, 92 yards and a touchdown. And he looked great doing it. it. Like, he looks like the best wide receiver on that field. Now, granted, again, this receiver room was just an absolute mess in terms of what Hugh Freeze was able to pick up last year. Clearly, he sold that to Cam Coleman and the other top-end wide receivers they got. But Coleman's absolutely taken the most advantage of it here. And to quote uh, Nate Marquise, I forget if he put this out in a tweet or if he just said this in our Slack channel, but and I, I agree with him on this, that... Peyton Thorne may not be a good quarterback, but Cam Coleman's going to make him look like a good quarterback. And I honestly agree. Again, Coleman looks like that guy that can almost single-handedly elevate this passing game moving forward. Now, we didn't get to see a lot of Robert Lewis, who's also apparently been getting a lot of spring buzz as well. We didn't get to see a ton of him yesterday. So we'll see there. 
But now from a CFF perspective, like, right, it's great that we have a true freshman here. It's great that he probably ends up being the wide receiver one for Auburn this year. But does it really matter? Um, what has Hugh Freeze done with wide receivers in the past before? Eh, he's kind of gone back and forth, right? It's, there's no consistency, really, when it comes to the receiving profiles under Hugh Freeze. We've had years where every single one of them got less than 700 yards. And in some years, we do have guys like Demario Douglas and Laquan Treadwell getting close to, if not above, 1,000 yards on their respective seasons. Both Treadwell and Douglas went on to be NFL contributors. So I do think, if again, if you think Coleman's that then I don't typically love suggesting to people to take a true freshman in redraft or best balls or anything like that. But if you're taking a shot on Jeremiah Smith, who obviously is super talented, but hasn't even locked up a starting gig, and you're not taking the shot on a guy like Cam Coleman, who has pretty much locked up a, wide, a starting wide receiver spot in a Hugh Freeze offense, which we know we kind of like to score quite a few points... I, I don't know what to tell you. Like it, to me, if you're comfortable taking true freshmen, like Cam Coleman's got to be one of the top guys on your board. So let's move on to UNLV. I know the Auburn was kind of short, but again, Cam Coleman was kind of the main story there. So, oh, and uh, Peyton Thorne looks pretty all right as well. But again, I think it's more Cam Coleman making him look really good. But let's move on to UNLV I'm going out west and start talking about some of these um, group of five teams. A lot of this information, again, comes from LasVegasSun.com, so shout out to them for a really, really good breakdown on what happened here. Matt Saluka fans, beware. Haj Malik Williams is going to be a thorn in the side of everybody who has been drafting Matt Saluka. Of course, and beat writers agree, the true competition for this UNLV starting job does not start until Matt Suka is here over the summer. But Haj Malik Williams is going to make that as hard as possible for Sluka in order to nail down this job. He looked great yesterday. 14 for 22, 227 yards, three touchdowns. Malik Williams can run or excuse me, Haj Malik Williams can run, very much fits this go-go offense for this team. Again, now he, he has several months ahead of Matt Sluka in being able to understand this playbook, get the reps and everything like that. The beat writers keep saying that like Matt Sluka will be the guy to beat once he gets there, but I really don't know unless Matt Sluka is just way better than I'm giving him credit for. So the good news to me from a quarterback's perspective is that whoever wins this job between Matt Saluka or Haj Malik Williams, they will have beaten out a really good secondary option for this Rebels offense. And that should be great news for anybody who does draft these guys towards the end of the year. I'm just not quite ready to take my shot on both these guys. Or if you are drafting Matt Saluka, Take the shot on Haj Malik Williams in like the 30th round. Let me is he even is he even getting drafted right now? No, he is not. Haj Malik Williams is available in the 30th round. If you are sitting there with five quarterbacks on your team and you're wondering what to do with your last pick, just spend it on the security that you get the quarterback in this offense. Um Let's see, do you want to talk about wide receivers or running backs next? We'll go wide receivers. There's a couple of interesting things here. One, clearly, Ricky White's still the number one guy. Everybody talks about it that way. He's going to be the number one guy again this year. No reason to think that will change. Based on his, the way he talks about the team, the way he talks about like working with some of the other guys, it doesn't sound like White is really having his foot outside the door. Like Obviously, there was a talk about Notre Dame trying to poach him. Um, before the spring but again just based on the way he's answering questions in interviews talking about talking about and with his teammates I doesn't seem like he's going anywhere so I'd be a little bit more comfortable today than I was a couple of weeks ago in terms of what the future for Ricky White holds out for uh, he had four catches 57 yards it's kind of the same thing as Kevin Concepcion they know what they got in him they know he's awesome throw the ball a couple times his way and let's try to get some other guys out there uh, Jacob De Jesus, a guy that a lot of us like, uh, did not have a great day. Three catches, four yards, no touchdowns. So a little bit of a rough one for him. A name to watch out for if, if you're playing in CFF Dynasty especially, Damian McDaniel. This is a true freshman, 
ran with the first team along with Haj Malik Williams and on the second drive of the game scored a 79-yard touchdown. You end up finishing the day with three catches, 91 yards, and a touchdown. And according to LasVegasSun.com, here is uh, what Ricky White had to say about him. This is, to me, probably one of the most interesting things. White is excited about the prospect of lining up and running routes next to McDaniel. Quote from Ricky White. That's my guy. I'm trying to take him under my wing. Obviously, he's a freshman, so he's got a lot to learn, but he's going to be a heck of a player. That is super interesting to me. The fact that Ricky White has identified this guy super early on. McDaniel is already working his way up into the ones in this offense. I don't know, guys. If you're looking, like people ask me all the time, who's who's some G5 true freshman that could break out, uh, break out in year one? I mean, this is one of those guys right here. I mean, Damian McDaniel right here, UNLV. We know we love the off, we love the wide receivers here. I don't see like we we know Ricky White's gonna be gone after this year in one way, shape, or form, whether he transfers or whether actually he might be out of eligibility after this year. So he's probably going to the NFL after this year. So. McDaniel might be that next guy up that we're all looking at here in the next couple of months. Running backs. Uh, for those of us, like me, who were kind of hoping that Jaden Daniels, or uh, Jaden Thomas, the true freshman running back who led the teams in touchdowns last year, would kind of start breaking away from this pack at running back. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. The Rebels seem pretty gung-ho here about staying in a running back committee. Odom... Uh, again, back, this also from the LasVegasSun.com. Odom said that there are five current running backs worthy of playing time if the season started today, and that's with highly rated freshman Devin Green still waiting to join the team over the summer. Quote from Odom, that group's really got a chance to be a bright spot for our team. I have no doubt about that. The running game was really good for UNLV last year. The problem was they split the carries up so much that it makes it hard to really bet on any of those guys. And again, I was hoping this year with so many guys leaving UNLV that we would see some breakaway for Jaden Thomas there, but doesn't seem like that's actually going to happen. So that's super unfortunate, but that's how the world works sometimes. All right, let's move on to the next team here. Sorry, I forgot to warn you guys that I was taking a sip of water, even though that annoys the heck out of you guys sometimes. Let's go back east. Let's go back to Alabama. We'll talk about the UAB Blazers here. Again, not a ton really to talk about, but again, a lot of names to kind of file away here, right? Uh, Adrian, or excuse me, uh, Jacob Zito, once again, is your starter. Nobody really surprised by that. Nothing really much coming out of the quarterback. Zeno didn't get a ton of run because, again, like Ricky White, like, like Kevin Concepcion, the staff knows what they got in him. Again, they wanted to make sure that Zeno's looking good after his, his injuries and everything like that. I will say from a dynasty perspective, again, this isn't defending the natty, but some things to talk about, I guess, on the next one. I was disappointed to see that Adrian Posse only got a single series and ran fourth in QB snaps. Uh, he's a guy that I like the talent of. I was kind of hoping he would come on and at least work his way up to third team, maybe even second team. Again, I know Landry Liddy is still sitting there at the number two quarterback position, but I was kind of hoping maybe Posse would kind of give him a run. Doesn't seem that way so far, so that's that's a bit disappointing. At running back, uh, Lee Beebe and Lee Witherspoon, the two Lees, got 10 carries apiece. They combined for 146 yards and two touchdowns. That's really good to see. Obviously, I don't think there's a ton you can ever really take away from spring games and the running back distribution that is taken from them unless the coaches come outright and say like they did at UNLV that we're going to have a committee in games so people might point at BB and be like oh he he got the same number of carries at Witherspoon like he's not going to be that guy like Jermaine Brown Jr. was last year maybe not but I don't think this is the thing you point at I'm just happy to happy of the fact that this running game was averaging almost seven yards a carry between the two of these guys. So well done. Clearly BB and Witherspoon doing really well there. Receivers, there's a couple of interesting things. One, Amari Thomas, who led the team in targets last year, caught nine balls for 80 yards and a score. That's super, super encouraging right there. He's probably your number one wide receiver for UAB. And if he's going to catch nine balls in a single game, this is a spring game where things are already kind of, you know, 
cut back, especially with the number of snaps a lot of these guys play, if Thomas was targeted at least nine times and pulled in nine balls just in this spring game, you have to think he's in for a huge workload going into next year. I mean, shoot, he already led the team in targets last year as a true freshman. Speaking of that class, that class for UAB in terms of their receivers are going to save them for the next three years because including Amari Thomas, they got Iverson Hooks who got hurt last year. He was supposed to be the one that got a lot of hype last year. We haven't heard much from him. He's still coming back from injury. But Cam Shanks is a redshirt freshman. He had the biggest performance on the day for this team. He went six catches, 116 yards, and two touchdowns. Now, he was working against some of the, um, some of the second team as well in this, but Again, another guy to kind of file away in your head. Some of these young guys are really kind of stepping up here and are available everywhere in your dynasty leagues, really. But if you're in a deep, deep league, I mean, Amari Thomas, shoot, what is he going as right now? I, I really should have wrote down some of these ADPs ahead of time. My apologies, y'all. Yeah, Amari Thomas is wide receiver 119, 27th round. We know this is a team that's going to pass 40 times a game. Why is wide receiver one for this team not being drafted until the... 27th round doesn't make much sense to me um anything else i want to say about uab i don't know i think that's pretty much it again we're kind of blazing through this a little bit so this might end up being a bit of a shorter episode here today y'all but maybe y'all don't mind that maybe y'all don't want to hear me talk for an hour and a half on end especially when i need to take drink breaks in between every single team here like the one i'm about to do right now all right Let's keep it down south. Let's go to Mississippi here and talk about Southern Miss. This is not a team we typically talk about from a CFF perspective, but there's a couple of interesting things kind of going on here. One, the quarterback battle between Ethan Crawford and Tate Rodemaker, the former Florida State quarterback last year. I think something to take interest in here. There's a lot of talk here about Ethan Crawford really needs to earn that starting job for the Golden Eagles. Again, um, he's coming back from a torn ACL, or excuse me, last spring he was missing because of a torn ACL, came back near the end of the year, showed some flashes for the Golden Eagles, and he's got some impressive strength, got some great athleticism, and in this, um, in this scrimmage, he was the most successful quarterback uh, considering he led the first touchdown drive on the day. Tate Rodemaker did not end up scoring a touchdown. More on that in a second. Again, we saw him run quite a bit. He's really, like, if if we're rooting for a CFF option here at Southern Miss, we want Crawford to win this job. He is the one that can provide the... He's, he's the one that can provide a CFF option at quarterback here because Rodemaker is a zero in the rushing department. Um, between the two of them, Rodemaker, uh, led the first two drives, which is something, obviously the fact that he was the first quarterback out there says something, but on the first drive, he failed to convert a fourth and one at the five yard line on the second drive. They got to a 30 yard field goal. And then on the third drive, he threw an interception. He, he finished with, uh, 118 yards on 17 attempts versus Crawford led two drives during the day that included a 50 yard touchdown a punt um but on the second drive we again saw that athleticism that crawford have it, on that drive they had to convert a third and 18 he didn't do that through the air he scrambled and got out of there and ran 19 yards to pick up the first down so once again if he can kind of make that next step and you have that athleticism be the deciding factor here to win that job at southern miss that's something we're going to love in for us in cff only problem is his accuracy definitely needs some work. Again, he went three for seven on the day, 71 yards and a touchdown. So obviously that 50 yard bomb was great to see, but again, we want to see the accuracy perform just a little bit better. But outside the quarterbacks, one name I'm starting to file away is a uh, true sophomore. Is it true sophomore? Yeah, true sophomore, JJ Butler. He did not record a catch last year. This is a guy that's completely off a lot of people's radars, but it looks like he is working his way into the first team and during the scrimmage led everybody in receptions. He had six receptions and 74 yards on the day. And he was, quote, 
the underneath favorite for each quarterback who threw to him. Um, from a quote from Will Hall here, I think he can be a quote go to target one day. I think he's growing into that role. JJ is a really good football player. This is his first spring. He gets better every day, and he's been thrown into the fire, and he's embraced that competition. JJ also went on to conduct interviews with the media afterwards, and you guys know how much I love that. So Butler has been a guy that has been consistently producing this spring. We saw it again in the spring game yesterday, again, 6 for 74. Nothing crazy or anything like that, but we heard it from the head coach, Will Hall's, voice himself there that one day butler could be a go-to target is that this year is that next year i'm not really sure and if we look at will hall's track record when it comes to offensive court or when it comes to offensive production for receivers uh, it's uh, not the greatest um the best we had was in 2022 where jason brownlee had 55 catches for 891 yards and eight touchdowns that's really about it most of his leading receivers have been 700 yards or less. So it's, again, as much as I want to get excited about Butler, the history here isn't, is kind of reining me back in here. But again, if I'm like 30th round of a best ball, I need a wide receiver. I'll probably throw a Butler share here and there just to see. Um, But it really will have to take the fact that if they get to the fall and there's nobody else for these quarterbacks to throw to, there's nobody else that can be as reliable as Butler. That's the only way he's going to be a CFF relevant guy. Like who else are they going to throw to kind of situation? Will Hall has already said that they're going to, they're going to try to add to the receiver room in the next portal window. That's what I'm going to kind of keep my eye out for. If we go through the spring portal window and Southern Miss does not find other receivers to add to this room, Then I'm going to get a bit more excited about Butler because currently it looks like he's the only guy out there that can do things for this passing game. One last little note with Southern Miss here is the running backs. Something that probably a lot of you since I brought up this team have been wondering about given the fact that Frank Gore Jr. has been a monster here the last couple of years. So you're wondering, all right, how do the running backs look? Uh, when it comes to the spring game, they were pretty quiet. Um, Drake Clark had five for 25 yards, couldn't get any stats on any of the other running backs there. But just for the most part, I really think, especially if Crawford is the quarterback here, I don't know if they're going to be relying on as much the running game as they have been in the past. Like, would you have a guy like Frank Gore Jr.? But we'll definitely see for right now, nobody's, or again, Dre Clark's the only name that they're naming in this backfield, which is probably a good thing on some level, but also, again, they keep throwing it with the fact that the running game's slightly disappointing right now. So we'll see moving forward. Again, to recap Southern Miss, Crawford, Tate Rodemaker, you want Crawford to win that job if you want a CFF option here. Maybe if you like J.J. Butler, you might want Tate Rodemaker to win that job because he's probably the better passer out of the two. And then, again, J.J. Butler, a name to file away. Running backs, a little quiet right now. Let's go take a look at Ball State. Let's go to the MAC. We got a couple of MAC teams that actually have some coverage when it comes to these spring games. Holla freaking Luya. Um, some interesting stuff with Ball State. Really kind of two main things. One, there is a new play caller at Ball State here. Jared Elliott, the... T- or Excuse me. I was about to say the former tight ends coach. He's not the he's not the former tight ends coach anymore, but he has assumed play calling duties and will become a co offensive coordinator along with Kevin Lynch, while he's still retaining his role as the tight ends coach. That's honestly great news for people who people who've been wanting to get more and more shares of Tanner Koziel. Tanner Koziel is a guy that has been going in the where is Tanner? Tanner is a guy that's honestly looks like he's going later than I thought. Yeah, tight end 26, past the 20th round. This is a dude that people were willing to draft in like the 10th and 11th round the last couple of years. Now, granted, he had a bit of a disappointing season last year. I don't blame you there, but now his coach is the main offensive play caller. They were able to get Tanner Koziel back out of the portal. So you have to think that there's some level of promise here that they're going to feature him more. And I think part of that comes with them saying like, hey, your your head coach or your coach, the guy who works with you the most, will be the one calling plays now. So 
If you're a Tanner Cozyell fan, nothing but good news right there. If you're a Kyle Kelly fan, this next piece I'm going to read to you from Ball State Daily News is not something that you're going to want to hear. So, it looks like we have a quarterback competition again at Ball State. Quote from the article, Although it seemed cut and dry that Kelly would return to the QB1 role after he filled for the final six games of the 2023 season, it was rising redshirt freshman Caden Simonza taking majority of Ball State's first team reps in the spring game. If you're a Kelly fan, you're banging your head against the wall right now because this is the second time that this staff has really kind of screwed over Kelly in a pretty decent way. Last year, they had Samoza as a true freshman come out and get the first team reps last year. And now they're doing it to Kelly again after Kelly proved to be the better quarterback, the better the guy to better run the offense in the second half of the year last year. So not that Kelly's been going super high in drafts. In fact, I don't think I don't think he's been touched in drafts so far. No, he has not been. But if you are somebody who is willing to take a shot on him at the end of the drafts, now you pretty much have the reason to hold off, at least for a little while, until we get some confirmation about what happens at this running back situation or or running back, excuse me, quarterback situation. Or you can draft him and hope that he transfers somewhere like, I don't know, like Ohio or something like that, and he becomes the starting quarterback there. So that's it for Ball State. Let's go talk about Toledo here a little bit. Not that we really needed a ton of confirmation here, but it it's nice to have some conf- confirmation of the fact that Tucker Gleason looks pretty solidly in the lead to be the quarterback one for Toledo. Quote from the um, Toledo Blade here. His official title isn't QB1, but everyone inside the program, including his main competition, uh, John Allen Richter, knows the inevitable outcome. Gleason took a bulk of the reps of the first team offense throughout the spring. The same story unfolded on Saturday as Toledo went through a traditional two-hour practice with 13 periods. So, again, confirmation there that looks like Tucker Gleason will be the guy moving forward, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, or you're really hoping that some one of these other guys might be able to overtake him. That doesn't look like it's happening, but it is good news because dual threat quarterback in the Mac. You love to see it. Uh, the other thing I kind of find interesting with some of the news out of Toledo is there's a lot of talk about the quarterback competition, obviously, but surprisingly very little coverage, in my opinion, on how Toledo plans to replace Penny Boone, right? Like you're talking about a 1,400 yard running back last year that has left your team and you got to replace him somehow. There's just not a ton of analysis there. Really, the only mentions are of Jacques Stewart. And this is quote a quote from the Toledo Blade on the spring game here. Quote, Jacques Stewart should be a comforting presence in the backfield. Again, it goes back to this thing I talked about earlier where like on one hand, he's the only guy that gets mentioned when it comes to this backfield. So that tells me on some level, he's kind of the main guy they're going to rely on. But also when it's paired with just the quotes of comforting presence and not things like, oh, he'll be a force. He'll be a guy we are relying on. He is things like that. It's hard to kind of read what they really want to see, what to expect out of Jacquez Stewart moving forward. Now, granted, if you are of the opinion that the fact that the only time we are hearing about running backs is when we're hearing about Jacquez Stewart, the good news is that he's going super late in drafts. He's RB77 in leagues right now. You talk about a little bit past the 20. I think this looking at this, you're talking about 21st, 22nd round. So super widely available if you want to take the shot there. But I don't know, just kind of interesting to me. I think we can finish up with a couple of spring scrimmages here. Uh, got two Mountain West schools and a Sun Belt team. Again, their spring games have not happened yet, but we got some pretty good, solid information out of some of the scrimmages that have been happening recently. We'll start with the Colorado State Rams. Again, not a ton to take away, but one thing I did want to touch on here was the running back situation here at Colorado State. One, before this year, we've never really been a big fan of Jay Norvell running backs. But I've noticed that Justin Marshall has been drafted quite a bit in best balls recently. And I think people really need to 
I don't know, lack of a better term, stop? Because you're talking about him being drafted as RB59, 15th round, so you're talking about your fifth running back off the board. He is He's the second Colorado State player off the board. He's being drafted ahead of Braden Fowler, Nicolosi, and Justice Ross Simmons, two guys I believe in way more in this offense. And it's not even just that I don't believe in Marshall. It's more the fact that we know that Norvell likes the running committee, and they have good options. Marshall got as many carries as he did last year because literally they were running out of bodies. Kobe Johnson, Damian Henderson, Avery Morrow, all three of those guys got hurt. Guess what? All three of those guys are back now. So to start the year, they're going to have four different guys that they're going to rotate. And guess what? In this spring scrimmage, they were rotating all four guys. So I again, that sounds hypocritical because earlier in the early in the show, I was talking about how you can't really. He, he, you can't judge what's going to happen in the fall in terms of number of carries with what they're doing now in the spring. So apologies for that on being slightly hypocritical there, but it's also based on the historic performance of what Jade Norvell has done with his running backs in the past. I just like running back 59, right? That's one spot behind Ricky hunt, one spot ahead of Roman Hemby, two spots behind Nathan Carter He's being drafted ahead of Corey Kiner, Jordan Waters, Marion Lukes. Like, those are all guys we know for a fact are the RB1s at their schools and are going to have a much better load share than what Marshall's going to get at Colorado State. So, I don't know. Mostly using this to kind of point out that in this in this scrimmage, they were rotating all four of those guys. All four of those guys are back. And Justin Marshall needs to come down in ADP. Um... Some of you might be asking about receivers. There were some good reports from guys like Dylan Goffney. Uh, also, I don't know if any of you know this because I found this out this past weekend, but Donovan Ali has transferred to Colorado State. There's some good reports about him. But I don't really know how much to really buy into that because both Tory Horton and Justice Ross Simmons were out. So it's a little hard for me to gather like what the actual hype to believe in is there. So, outside of Colorado State, we'll go to Boise State now. They had themselves a closed spring scrimmage that we were able to get some information out of. Malachi Nelson took the, um, was the first quarterback out there, went 7 for 10, 73 yards, and a touchdown, so pretty solid there. Maddox Madsen, who many believe is his main competition, did not participate in the scrimmage, which, I, I don't know, guys, that pretty much tells me that Malachi is probably going to end up locking this up if Madsen isn't going to be available for a good chunk of spring here. But just something to note there again, that Matt, Maddox Madsen is, did not participate in the scrimmage and that he's still recovering. So I don't know, again, to, I'm going to sound repetitive here, but really kind of tells me that Nelson has the job locked up. So I might move him up slightly in my rankings, but other kind of things to note here. One, we didn't get really a lot of, word out of the running back situation because both Ashton GNT and John Bryce Dubar both sat out of this game. And plus, I think the coaching staff, again, they know what they have in GNT. They know what they have in Dubar. They're great. Let's see what we can get out of this passing game. See who steps up at receiver. And if you want a name, Prince Strawn. Prince Strawn was the star of the passing game on Saturday, led the Broncos receivers with four catches for 71 yards. Pretty much it. Uh, Latrell Caples, who is a guy that I think a lot of people forget about when they start naming Boise State wide receivers. Uh, he caught Malachi Nelson's lone touchdown in a corner of the end zone. So another name to kind of think out. I will say, it a Camper is out due to injury, but Chris Marshall was not mentioned at all in this article or this scrimmage. So, or yeah, for this scrimmage, excuse me. So again, that's not a death nail, for anybody who might be hyping up Chris Marshall, but I would say currently, if you're going to look for guys that are actually playing and making impacts, I would say Prince Strawn and Latrell Caples are the two guys I would take shots on for Boise State's wide receiver situation. But even still, we already know that this team is going to be heavily, heavily run first. Like, why wouldn't you be? It's Ashley GNT and John Brady Barr back there. They're going to run everybody into the ground. But if you're going to take a shot on receiver, I'll take a shot on Prince Sean. I'll take a shot on Latrell Caples. Because before 
um, if, if you all been listening to CTN long enough, we had an interview with Stefan Cobbs, who was a guy that a lot of us were drafting pretty early on just a couple of years ago. We had an interview with him. We asked him, who do you, who else do you expect to kind of step up in that receiver room? And the very first name he said was Latrell Caples. And Latrell Caples did lead Boise State in receiving that very year. And then last year he got injured. So we'll see if he's able to bounce back. But he's kind of a name that, you know, he's going for free in drafts right now. So you get to the end, you don't know what to grab. I take a shot on Latrell Caples every once in a while. So again, end of draft kind of deal. Last thing we'll talk about here is the South Alabama uh, Jaguars here. Quarterbacks, we... Again, this is going to sound crazy, but again, Gio Lopez and Bishop Davenport split time with the first team, but Davenport was also getting work with the second team. So as much as Lopez and Davenport were, again, quote-unquote splitting time, Lopez is the is the front runner for the job right now. Davenport was getting work with the first team and the second team. Mostly, again, I think to really prepare him to be a backup there. Lopez finished the day pretty solidly, 13 for 19, 192 yards, one touchdown, one interception. That interception didn't come until the very end of the scrimmage when he was trying to hit a deep ball into the end zone. So... Uh, got a little bit of hype for Jamal Pritchett here. He caught a 42-yard touchdown on the second drive uh, throw from Gio Lopez. So, obviously, those two are are hooking up pretty well. There's been a lot of talk of Braylon McReynolds being kind of the main guy, but it was Kentrell Bullock who got two short yardage touchdowns in this game. So, even, again, I this, this South Alabama running back duo between McReynolds and Kentrell Bullock might end up becoming a pretty big headache here. If Reynolds is the guy like between the 20s, but then they hand it off to Bullock along the goal line. Regardless, they had 19 carries on the day for 74 yards, so pretty solid production. They also caught seven balls between the two of them, so they're both clearly, clearly pretty involved here In regardless of who's on the field. I just think that moving forward, it seems like Bullock and McReynolds are going to be a pretty split duo here and we're not going to see either one of them get to the LaDamian Webb production that we saw last year, which is a shame because I have quite a few Kentrell Bullock shares, but I got to read the tea leaves and this is what the tea leaves are telling me. And then the last thing I'll mention here is another name to file away. We all know Jamal Pritchett. We like him. Devin Voison is another guy that people um, like and are kind of filing away. But Shamar Sand- Sand- Sandgren is a receiver to certainly put away. He was running with the first team. He actually had the best production of receiver on the day. Seven, excuse me, seven receptions for 121 yards and a touchdown from Bishop Davenport in this game. I have not been able to figure out where it is on the field that he is playing. We know Pritch is on the outside, but we saw Colin Lacey last year produce at a top end CFF wide receiver production level in the slot. And so if Sandrin or Sandgren, excuse me, starts producing well, again, this is a team that potentially could have two receivers to feed and both of them get up there pretty solidly. Again, do, do I think they're going to have two receivers in the top 20? Probably not. But if they get two receivers in the top 35 and you can get two receivers here who can both be CFF options. Just something to file away. Uh, if we hear more about Shamar Sandgren moving forward, this is where his story starts right here because otherwise we got nothing on him. I couldn't find any information on what he was able to do in Juco or anything like that. So, But some fun names to file away there. And with that being said, that's all I got for you guys today. Again, It's a lot of spring games around the around the league um next next week is going to be absolutely nuts uh again just naming schools off the top of my head here or i say off the top of my head i got a sheet right in front of me that says all of them minnesota georgia state eastern michigan ucf kansas coastal carolina east carolina houston boston college central michigan cincinnati florida atlantic ohio state purdue texas state arkansas florida georgia georgia tech kentucky middle tennessee state tennessee utah LSU, Old Dominion, Penn State, Pitt, Temple, South Florida, Virginia Tech, Alabama, Miami, Ole Miss, FIU, Nevada. All of those, 
all of those are next Saturday. So we got a massive, massive spring game haul next week. We're we'll probably going to have a long, long show next week as we kind of break a lot of those down. Um, I really hate how more and more of these schools are shoving it all into a single Saturday. It makes it really hard on all of us. But one last thing, and I probably should have said this at the top of our show. It's fun to look at these spring games and kind of take some takeaways and everything like that. Look at guys who perform well. But at the same time, historically, spring game heroes don't typically do super well moving forward. That's why, again, I, to- I-, I hyped up Noah Rogers at NC State a little bit. But I still think he's a guy you take later in your drafts. I'm not saying go and draft or he should be moving up to like the even the ninth, tenth round if K- if Casey's a second, third round value. No, no, Rogers. I like him as a receiver. Keep him in the thirtieth round. Uh, Wesley Grimes. Like him as a receiver. Keep him in the thirtieth round. J.J. Butler. I like him. I like what he can potentially do for Southern Miss this year. He should not go much further than or sh- much higher than the twenty eighth, twenty ninth round. In addition to that, again, like uh, Shamar Sandrin or Sand Grant, I, why, why do I keep messing that up? It's like his last name's not even that far off from my own. Like Sand Grin. Anyway, like he's not a guy that should ever go much higher than the last one or two picks in a draft for you. I'm throwing a lot of names out there as people that we could potentially see in a couple of months and say like, okay, now we can move them up. But these spring games are not the reason why these spring games can get our attention on them. And if we continue to hear great things, once the fall rolls around, then we can start to get a bit more excited. But for right now, lots and lots of good stuff from all around the country here. And with that, we have come to the end of our show. Once again, Appreciate all of you guys for listening. If you're not already, go ahead and leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're on the podcast side of things, make sure you follow the show and leave a five-star review wherever you can. If you're on Apple Podcasts right now, I issue a challenge to you. I want to see at least five reviews placed on our Apple Podcasts by the end of next week because it has been a while since any of you have put one down and I miss you guys. I miss the little five-star reviews that you guys used to give me. So let's go ahead and get those up and rolling again. In addition to everything, make sure you check out the rest of the Campus Again podcast network for shows ranging on, like I said at the start of the show, pretty much anything you can think of related to the college fantasy game, whether it be DFS, whether it be um, C2C, Devi, obviously us over here with CFF Redraft, and also CFF Dynasty with Defending the Natty. We'll see you guys back here next Monday where, like I said, we got a crap ton of spring games to discuss next week as well. So buckle in, boys. We're in for a long one next week. Until then, really appreciate you guys and hope you guys have a wonderful and blessed week. See y'all.